In this video, we're gonna talk about the problem of technical exercises. So without further ado, let's jump right in. So we're gonna start by asking three questions about technical exercises. And my goal with this is to be thought provoking and sort of help others think outside the box when it comes to technical exercises, because they can actually be more of a hindrance to technical development than a help in many cases. So question number one is what are these exercises supposed to do? And this question um, seems obvious like, well, finger independence, okay. But if you actually look through Hannon, you can actually ask that question for each and every one. You might actually be surprised that sometimes it doesn't seem obvious what it's really trying to do because we just have all these different random you know, patterns that we're supposed to re repeat to infinity. And are they really supposed to develop finger independence? Well, I don't know. It's something to think about. So question number two is how are they supposed to accomplish this? And I think this is actually more important. So once we determine what we think the exercises are supposed to accomplish, then we can ask, well, how are they supposed to accomplish this? Okay. And in many cases, this is actually the most thought provoking question because sometimes we'll have these exercises that are supposed to say, develop finger independence and we'll actually practice them for a few weeks, a month. And then what we'll determine is my fingers actually aren't really more independent. In fact, they actually feel weaker and more sloppy and, and I, I almost feel like I can control them less. And so this is a really important and even more important than the first one. Now, the third question is how am I supposed to practice these exercises in order to achieve these results? And this again is even more important than the first two questions because we can all, we can all sort of realize that there are many ways to skin a cat as it were, which is kind of a weird uh, saying, but that's what people say. So if we think about that in relation to the keyboard, we can think about it like this. If I'm gonna play a chord, for instance, let's say just take a C chord, okay? I can be on the surface of the keys and I can jab my fingers down like so. That's one way I could play a chord. I could play a chord by dropping into the keys like so. I could play a chord by having a really low wrist and just sort of like pulling down on the keys. Now these are three different examples of how I could be playing a chord. So when we go back to that question number three, you know, how am I supposed to practice these exercises in order to achieve these results? This is really what I'm talking about, okay? When it comes to playing a scale, am I supposed to lift each finger independently and play very loudly? Am I supposed to keep my fingers really close to the keys? Okay, well, what is my arm supposed to be doing? How is my arm supposed to be moving? These are the essential questions. Now, quick little caveat here. Inevitably, I get a comment that says, well, you seem to be against Hannon or whatever, you know, technical exercises. And, you know, I just think that, you know, you're right, you know, practicing them mindlessly, as it were, isn't helpful. But gosh, you know, if you practice them mindfully, then they're, they're really, really helpful. Inevitably, I start thinking to myself, man, I should make a video and, and talk about this because I feel like sometimes people miss the point that I'm trying to make. And so let me just clarify here. I'm not saying that Hannon is bad. I'm not saying that Liszt or Schmidt or any of those are bad. None of them are bad. What I am saying is, is that if we don't understand how to practice them, if we don't even understand what they're supposed to accomplish, then they're not really gonna be helpful. For instance, think about it like this. Why do I have my students practice scales and arpeggios? Well, one, they need to learn those scale and arpeggio patterns because they're found all over in music. And they have a lot of different fingering patterns. So it's really important to learn those patterns. Number two, it's a really effective means of teaching the hand and the arm to move up and down the keyboard and to actually um, learn to shift from note to note, release the fingers properly, etc. Same thing, you know, with an arpeggio. It's a really effective means of teaching how to move up and down the keyboard, okay? And again, we find these patterns everywhere in music, so they're really, really useful. I'm a little bit less enthused when it comes to something like Hannon or Schmidt because we don't find Hannon in music, okay? But we do find scales and arpeggios in music, so that's sort of my thought process in that. Again, if we don't know why or how we should practice exercises, 
then we should probably rethink our practice strategy. Now we're going to look at a couple exercises here for just a moment. I'm going to look at Hannon and we're going to choose one of them. And, and let's actually, let's choose a different one than people usually choose because, you know, we could talk about number one all day long. But let's look at number five. And there's actually a reason why we're going to look at this one. This is the pattern, and I'm just going to play with the right hand here. But this is the pattern. We have, and we just go up a note, etc. If we think about what we, the questions that we were asking, what are these supposed to do? Now, in my view, these are supposed to teach rotation. Notice how when I'm playing this, and I know I'm playing an octave higher, but Notice that I'm rotating. Every single note is going in a different direction. Low on the keyboard, high on the keyboard, low on the keyboard, high on the keyboard. So that's perfect for rotation, okay? Again, if you haven't seen some of my videos where I talk about rotation, it's this motion in our arm where, where the bones of our, my forearm are literally sort of rotating over the top of each other, okay? So it's, this, it's like I'm opening a doorknob, right? Um, it's this rotational movement. This is um, essential to developing piano technique, okay? And that's, this exercise is perfect for teaching that, okay? So I'm going to rotate left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. So notice how every single note is going higher or lower on the keyboard. So it is perfect for teaching this concept of form rotation, okay? Same thing in the left hand. especially on this, this first, uh, the first two notes where we have this leap of a sixth. This is actually really, really, really good because instead of reaching with the hand, extending the hand, okay, which causes tension, what I can do is when I do this is sort of like throw my hand up there and it naturally helps my thumb to release in the right hand or my fifth finger to release. It's what could be referred to as a rotational release, okay? When I do that, it sort of naturally just lets my hand and everything come with me there. To answer that first question, what is this supposed to accomplish? It's supposed to teach rotation. We could also say a rotational release or leaping, okay? Now, two, how is it supposed to accomplish this? Well, I think I already pretty much covered that, but to reiterate that, every note goes in, in an opposite direction, lower on the keyboard, higher on the keyboard, etc. So it is perfect to teach that concept. So that's how it's supposed to accomplish this. Then the other question is, how am I supposed to practice that? Again, we've pretty much already talked about this, but we're supposed to use rotation, okay? Do you see how when it comes to any exercise, and this is especially important for me as a teacher, but for you, if you're learning on your own, you know, et cetera, this also can be helpful for you. But, you know, especially as a teacher, I have to think, why would I give my student a hand and ex exercise to practice unless I know exactly why? This is what it's supposed to accomplish, etc. Okay? Now we can look at another exercise. Okay? Uh, and for this, we're going to look at Schmidt, the preparatory exercises, Opus 16. And we're just going to look at number one. Okay? So, number one, we have this sort of pattern. And this is really just like a five finger scale. And then we're supposed to, you know, re repeat that, whatever. So let's go through our three questions and see if we can figure this out. See if it's actually pedagogically sound, if it's actually useful in teaching something. Number one, what is this supposed to do? Well, I think that this could actually be a great means of teaching rotation or a little bit of an arm shift when we have notes that are right next to each other going up in a line. So for instance, I can still use rotation even if I have notes that are going in the same direction. So I can think about rotating left to my thumb and then a little bit to the right, a little bit to the right, right, right. Now see how my hand is tipped a little bit to the side. Now I can actually rotate back down. So there's a little bit of that. There's a little bit of that ro rotary movement going back and forth, okay? Now number two, how is it supposed to accomplish this? Well the notes are actually lined up in a way that enables me to apply rotation 
to again notes going in one direction. So continuing up the keyboard and then continuing down the keyboard, etc. And this is actually really helpful to then apply that to scale plane. It's a little bit harder to do that in scale plane because I have, you know, rotate left, right, right, left again on my thumb. That's a little bit hard. So this can actually be a good stepping stone to that. Now, number three, how am I supposed to practice? Well, we're supposed to practice by exaggerating this rotational movement, making sure that my arm is aligned behind each finger as we go. So my arm will be shifting up like this, as well as rotating on every note. So big rotation to the left. Okay, and I'm kind of exaggerating this. Big rotation to the left, little to the right, 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 right. And I can be a little bit on the side when I'm practicing this. You'll notice that when I'm playing, I, I'm not quite as, as, you know, tilted to the side, okay? But for practice sake, that's actually really useful, okay? So again, we can see how we can go through these three questions and we can ask them about whatever exercise we're actually doing. This will actually make exercises much more effective. If you can't answer those questions in a way that makes sense and is logical and again, pedagogically sound, then you just shouldn't practice them, okay? Now, that also goes for list. I know, I'm saying this about list. It's almost like I'm saying something bad about list. Here's the thing. Um, I remember watching this video a number of years ago where this teacher, a great teacher, uh, Dr. John Mortensen, and he was saying how people are really infatuated with this idea that, you know, I studied with a teacher who studied with a teacher who studied with a teacher who studied with Liszt. So I can trace my pianistic heritage back to Liszt. And he was like, basically everyone can, not a big deal, who cares? But he went on to say, and this is the interesting part, that he's read transcripts upon transcripts upon transcripts of Liszt's teaching that was written down by his students. And he said, there's not a word about technique. It's all just interpretation. So I would say that though Liszt was a great interpreter and he was a great inspirer, he inspired many students to play incredibly well, he didn't really teach technique in that sense. He just wrote exercises. And some of these exercises can be helpful. But again, you can open this to any exercise. If you can't figure out how to practice this, what is it supposed to accomplish, and how am I supposed to accomplish it, then you just absolutely should not practice it. And I know someone in the comments is going to disagree, and that's totally fine. But I think that understanding this and thinking about this concept will actually help you to develop your technique much faster and avoid problems. Piano technique is not built by mindlessly practicing anything, but by consciously applying good principles of movement to whatever it is we're practicing. So whether it's scales and arpeggios, whether it's a Hannon exercise, whether it's a Schmidt exercise, or even a list exercise, we have to understand how to practice it so that that can actually be effective and go to building our technique and not just wasting time at the keyboard. So I hope that this made sense. I hope that you got some value out of it. If you have any questions or comments, make sure and put those down below. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.